everyone, I'd like to welcome all of you back to Ohio Exopolitics. I'm your host, Mark Snyder, and we're going to be studying the Billy Meyer case for the first hour. And the second hour, I'm going to have a guest on named Frosty Wooldridge, and he's an expert on population. So we're going to talk about the immigration problem we're dealing with at the southern border uh, next hour. But uh, this first hour, I'm going to cover some of the topics in the Meyer case. And the first thing I think I'll start out with is learning uh, Billy's material. Billy, Billy Meyer, first of all, if you've never heard who he is, he's a, he's a man that's 81 years old. He lives in Switzerland in a tiny mountain village called Hinterschmidruti, which is about 45 minutes east of Zurich. And he has written some of the most profound information on the planet, uh, the greatest source of wisdom that I've ever found. And four of the major books uh, that he's written have been translated into English. And that would be The the Might of Thoughts, The Psyche, The Way to Live, and then another one called The Goblet of Truth. And you can download that as a PDF to your computer if you'd like. And what do these books teach us? Particularly, they teach us about what's called the teaching of the spirit, which deals with how we control our thoughts, how we should live, and what and how reincarnation is. And you're also going to learn something called the creational natural laws. So we're going to talk a little bit about this this evening. Uh, One of the books that I've spent a good deal of time in is called The Might of Thoughts. And one of the things that Billy explains is that the might of thoughts is always bound up with the corresponding feelings. So the thoughts and the feelings work together. The feelings grow out of the thoughts. Now that's different than emotions. The emotions kind of just surge upward and out of control many times. But your feelings will grow out of your thoughts. And we currently on our level of evolution here on the planet we don't even understand all of our feelings and if you look back through your life i'm sure you've done things you've said things and you and you think back you know that was really bothering me and i don't know why exactly so one of the things we have to do is to come in touch with our world of thoughts and get them under control so we don't have these erratic feelings. Because the thoughts and the feelings together exert a monstrous might, and they can affect your health. You know, if you're a very angry person, it can very profoundly affect your liver because your thoughts actually influence the blood chemistry that you have, and you can create cancers in your liver through anger. So the thoughts and the feelings exert a might, a monstrous might on the health of the human being, and they can even determine whether you live or die. So one of the things that the might of thoughts teaches us is that we, we need to learn to control our thoughts, and we need to maintain a neutral, positive balance to our thoughts. That means we're not negative, we're not positive except just slightly to the positive. And if you stay in that state, then you'll maintain control of your life. You'll, you'll bring in positive circumstances to your life. So, and what does it mean to be neutral positive? Well, there are five tests you can use. And, you know, when I first read this book a couple, a couple of times, um, I kind of... You know, you just don't absorb everything. You don't, when you study the Meyer material, when you read it, you may read it the first time. If you read the Meyer thoughts just for the first time, if you're honest with yourself, you probably only understood maybe 10 or 15% of the book, if that much. So what you have to do is you have to commit certain passages to memory. And other thing that you have to do when you're studying his material is spend a lot of time just thinking about certain things. For example, 
we're we're going to also talk about something called the love of creation today. And boy, there's some really uh, challenging things to to wrap your mind around. But tell yourself that you're confident, you're optimistic, you're relaxed, you're cheerful, and you're enthusiastic. And if you can go down that list of five things, there are more, but if you can go down that list of five things, and you can see, wow, you know, I really need to be a little more cheerful today, or I'm not feeling so confident today. So this, this is something you need to go back in and change your thoughts. You know, one of the things, there are also several things I've memorized from the Might of Thoughts, for example. One thing says, I'm the master of my own destiny, the forger of my own fortune, the creator of my own good luck. Now, one thing that we do not get in our current society is that understanding that you really are the master of your own destiny and the forger of your own fortune. I have to tell myself that continually. Now, why do I do, have to do that? Is because from the years of one year to seven years, you were programmed with all the negativity of our civilization. We have so many wrong ideas and wrong notions. And the first seven years of your life, you're like a tape recorder. Everything goes into the subconscious. And this is some of Dr. Bruce Lipton's uh, teaching. And he's done a lot of research in there. And he learned a lot of this actually studying stem cells. Because stem cells react directly to the environment that they're in, in the Petri dish. So some stem cells will become uh, muscle cells, some stem cells will become fat cells, other ones will become bone cells, just based on what's in the Petri dish as the medium. So when your thoughts kick off, you change your blood chemistry and your, your body will actually... Um, change based on your blood chemistry. So this is something that we have to be very aware of. I had someone that sent me a message, am I on the air? I certainly believe so. Certainly hope so. Because um, I'm talking away. <laughs> it looks like I'm on the air. So anyway, so um, Dr. Bruce Lipton calls it paint by numbers. So as you think your mind produces a blood, certain blood chemistry, and that blood chemistry then affects your health. Now, Billy may not use those exact same words, but he does, in many ways, say the same kind of thing. So, let me give you a little bit of background for Edward Albert Meyer, uh, so this makes a little more sense, and then we'll get back into this. Um, he grew up in Budlach, Switzerland during World War II, and he started to get telepathic messages from an extraterrestrial man named Spoth, and Spoth eventually landed a strange silvery pear-shaped craft in northern Switzerland, and uh, Billy came to the ship and he would always write as it felt as if he was lifted up by ghostly hands. He was put into the ship through some technological means. And Spoth would start to be his mentor for the next 11 years. And one of the, the big lessons that Spoth gave Billy is about his previous lives. Because Edward Albert Meyer, according to the Meyer material, has been... The people that we call Enoch, Elijah, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Emmanuel, and Muhammad. And in each one of these previous lifetimes, he taught something called the teaching of the Spirit, which was twisted and distorted by our religions very much. And he's this spirit form is back on the earth again as another personality um, as Edward Albert Meyer 
an 81 year old man in Switzerland. And he's written all of these books to help us evolve. So let's talk a little bit about reincarnation. So we all have a what's called a spirit form. The spirit form is a fragment of the universal consciousness. It's, it's neutral positive. It's just like the universal consciousness. It, it can never be harmed. It can never get sick. It, would never, it can never be confused in any way. Uh, it enters into the body of the child at 21 days after the sperm fertilizes the egg. Well, the child at this point, 21 days, is still an embryo when that spirit form comes in. And it brings with it a new personality for the current lifetime. It brings with it a subconsciousness which is programmed with all the evolutive values of the previous life, what you've learned in terms of love and logic and confidence and discernment and uh, wisdom, all of these different things are in your subconscious from all your previous lives. But at this level of our evolution, we don't really typically um, understand our previous lives. We're kind of shielded from them because at the current level of evolution, we have no means to deal with the fact that We've had all these previous lives and all the trauma associated with these previous lives. So, so again, let me reiterate, the spirit comes out of an energy band around the planet called the spirit realm. It brings with it the new what's called the material consciousness. So we've got a spiritual consciousness and a material consciousness. And they both go into this area called the superior colliculus, which is in the center of your middle brain. And this is where your eyesight is controlled, your hearing is controlled, your smell. All this is controlled from this central location. Now, your spirit form is not so... It has an unusual consciousness. Let's say this. Your spirit form is not aware when you're driving a car. It has nothing to do with you writing a book. It is monitoring everything that you think <coughs> and it's recording now what happens is when you have a thought it will tell you if your thinking is right or wrong and the material I've never seen exactly it say how I can speculate a little bit uh, the reason I can say that it's monitoring what you're thinking is because Billy's third contact a woman named Semyasi said, every human being has a spirit that never dies, that never sleeps, records everything that you do, and it will tell you if your thinking is right or wrong if you've learned to pay attention to it. Now, I do know from other passages that the spirit impulses the material consciousness. So you're getting impulses from your spiritual consciousness. So you think a thought... And let's say it's not neutral positive, it's negative, okay? And you get a, suddenly, you get this negative feeling. Well, it could be that that negative feeling is the impulse or the result of the impulse from your spiritual consciousness. So if you become adept at listening to what's going on inside you, you can interpret this a little bit more. And you can start to recognize when you're having negative feelings. And you can start to analyze yourself and say, look, hey, this thought is not neutral positive. I don't know why yet, but it's not neutral positive because I'm not getting the correct, um, I'm not getting the correct feeling from this. So we do not understand our feelings yet, as I said earlier. We're, not, we're, we're at the second stage of evolution. There are seven stages of evolution that human societies go through. We're at stage two, which um, it's the stage before intelligence. We're not even an intelligence society. We're in what's called rational life. So this, let me reiterate, the spirit form comes in to the embryo. 
into the subconsciousness is programmed the wisdom from the previous lives. Now, some people occasionally will have a memory from a previous life. And a lot of times this happens when a person hasn't spent very much time in the spirit realm. So, so let's say you had a traumatic ending to your life, the previous life, and because of overpopulation, you don't get enough time in the spirit realm. This is one of the problems. During the second hour, we're going to talk about overpopulation. But it's one of the problems affecting the reincarnational patterns on the earth is that people aren't, the, you're not getting enough time in the spirit realm to analyze all of your actions and all your thoughts and your spirit form doesn't get enough time to absorb everything that you learned. So you're in this unprepared state. Your personality doesn't get completely formed, particularly the male personality. And you reincarnate too soon, and somehow you've got these, even sometimes traumatic memories that are flying around. It doesn't happen very often, but it does occasionally happen. Someone will reincarnate and, and remember now, at the fifth stage of evolution, it's called the age of recognitions. At that point, we can start to remember. But you will be thousands and thousands and millions, literally millions of years more advanced than you are right now. So, I talked about overpopulation. One of the problems with the spirit realm, when we have like over 100 billion spirits activated in the spirit realm. I think it's 129 billion this interrupts the male personality from forming correctly, and you can see that in our society right now. You don't see that many strong male figures. You don't see much leadership because of the spirit forms coming in too soon. Now, they can, you can always, once you, once you are in the physical realm, you can always make corrections. You can always improve yourself. It doesn't mean it's hopeless. But... And part of the imbalance right now on our planet is because of the, the spirit realm. In other words, people are reincarnating too soon. They're not getting enough time in the spirit realm to even learn everything from their previous life. So they come into the next life and they're not completely prepared for what they're dealing with. So the reincarnational patterns are, are upset. In a normal, if we were at a balance of about 500 million or so, or a billion people, people would be getting, if you lived 100 years, you'd get 152 years in the spirit realm. And this would give you plenty of time to form what are called the, the essences of, of everything that you've learned. In other words, it takes... A certain amount of time in the spirit realm to really absorb what you need to know for the next life. Uh, there's a guy in Figu, Canada called Michael Uderbrook who has written, or excuse me, he, he created a presentation. It's a movie you can watch on YouTube that talks about the reincarnational process. It's very, very important to understand this, the spirit form that you have, it evolves independently. Everyone's spirit form evolves independently through your material consciousness in the physical realm. So we are, through the spirit form, we're collecting wisdom and knowledge through countless reincarnations. The, the material consciousness is doing your decision making and your thought processes most mo mostly, but uh, the spirit form is still monitoring this process, and it will like signal your material consciousness. Now, the spirit form is genderless, just like creation. Creation is not some man standing in judgment. The universal consciousness is genderless. It has no personality. And we'll talk about this a little bit more in a second. Um, the universal consciousness is 46 trillion years old. And it creates galaxies and stars, 
during its expansion phase. It takes, it, it takes over 100 trillion years to finish the expansion phase. But once the spirit form enters into the human body, remember I was talking about that earlier, its goal is to collect wisdom and knowledge through all these reincarnations. And so what it's doing, the spirit form, is during your physical life, it's like recording everything that you do, all of your thoughts, all your impulsations, and it's sending you signals occasionally to tell you when your thinking is right or wrong. Now, your spirit form, if you're a typical Earth human, is about 4.5 million years old, which is probably astonishing. So you can imagine all the wisdom of your prior lifetimes. If you can learn to control your thinking, because you don't really use your wisdom when you're not thinking in a neutral, positive way. You're, you're more being driven by emotions and by what are called ideas, I-D-E-A, I-D-E-A-S, which are incomplete, not fully developed thought patterns. So when you're driven by emotions and you're driven by thought patterns which aren't completely developed, it leads to what are called tangled ideas, which tend to confuse your thinking. Now, think about all the people today that have confused thinking. Go watch them on YouTube. You can see people. They're driven by their emotions. They want to cry on YouTube. They want to cry on television. Or they want to show anger. Or they, they have this anger. Well, it's because their thoughts aren't completely developed. So they get tangled ideas. It causes a misdirection of the thinking, which triggers the emotion. So you see the social justice warrior crying or whatever. And this um, triggers the emotion, and it can lead to murder and manslaughter, which is why this whole civil war scenario is starting to unfold more and more and more and more. Remember, the Meyer material tells us that we may have two civil wars unless we can learn to control our thinking. And one of the ways to help create stability is to take away the fear of death. So re remember that your spirit form will, will live again in another personality. It isn't a one-shot deal in this lifetime. So you can relax a little bit. You know, you don't have to worry. It's not a one-shot deal. In fact, you've probably had four and a half million previous lifetimes. And we spend 40 to 60 million years, and we spend millions of years, 40 to 60 million years in this first five stages of evolution or five stages of reincarnation. Now, part of that is spent in the spirit realm. Part of that is spent in the physical. Uh, probably today we're spending more time, if we continue our overpopulation, we'll spend more time in the physical than the spirit realm, which means I don't think we get the preparation. So when you die, the spirit form comes out of the body. The heart stops beating. And the spirit form takes the material consciousness with it. Now at this point, the material consciousness is... It's dormant so so people people think they're seeing um you know heaven they have this that's just before this the, the the brain shuts off they're not what they're doing is they're seeing what they've been programmed to see because the material consciousness doesn't function once death kicks in you know people aren't on the other side over there you can't really re, you can't really talk to them now, and I don't want to get into that, but there is something strange that happens in that whole process. But um, that, that material consciousness will eventually go into what's called the overall consciousness block. 
and it will be processed. And during in that overall consciousness block, which is a storage bank in the spirit realm, the consciousness is dissolved. It's kind of broken down. And it 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 is broken into these evolutive values, which are based on truth and reality. And eventually these evolutive values are stored in the spirit form. And they're timeless. And we're talking about values like love and wisdom and harmony. And this is the purest kind of knowledge. So your material consciousness and your spirit form, they retreat out of the physical body and they go back to the spirit realm after death. And this whole process takes place. The material consciousness is placed into the storage bank called the overall consciousness block. And then the personality is dissolved and the evolutive values are absorbed by the spirit form. And these consciousness forms are, are things like love, honesty, respect, patience, dil patience, diligence, humor. And they're stored in the spirit form. The, they're programmed into the subconscious. And then uh, at the appropriate time, the spirit form goes back to the material realm and brings with it this new personality. And all these evolutive values from the previous life, they're stored in the spirit form. So, so it's very interesting. Uh, again, under idea conditions, if you spend 100 years in the physical life, you'd spend 152 years processing that information. And that's, and that's plenty of time to form the new personality correctly. But today, again, because of overpopulations, you, we, you can say we have premature incarnations into the physical. And that leads to an instability in the personality. And these kinds of people which reincarnate too soon, they're more li likely to be addicted. We have a tremendous opiate addiction today, partially because of this sort of thing. This person needs more support from their parents because they haven't programmed all those new evolutive values into their, into their uh, subconscious. The masculinity of the personality does not have enough time to form. And this is the very sad part of this, is these cycles never return to normal. Even if we got the population down where it belonged, there are too many spirit forms in the spirit realm. And too many spirit forms activated. So we currently have about 129 billion spirit forms in the fine material realm around our planet. And that means that each one of these spirit forms has had at least one incarnation. So the spirit form is a very... Um, and the more I study it, you know, we live in a strange universe. I'll say that. It's a, it's a wonderful, but it's a universe, but it is strange, at least from my particular point of view. So let me read a little bit from the book, The Psyche. Let me tell you, first of all, about the book, The Psyche. If you're going to study the Meyer material, you could go out to um, Michael Horn's website. I think it's called afly.com, and you can order the books through him, or you can go through one of the Figu sites. And this is the first book you ought to order. And don't feel bad if you read the first 20 pages and say, I don't think I understood any of that. It'll take some time. You'll have to go over it and over and over again. Okay. Let's talk about, again, the spiritual and the material consciousness. Your spirit form, which is about four and a half million years old if you're a typical Earth human, it's considered a part piece of the universal consciousness. It can never die. It will never sleep. It can never be disturbed 
and it cannot be negatively affected by the material realm. So your spirit form is a source of stability in your life. However, you have what's called a material consciousness, which is who you are, this personality, this lifetime. And the material consciousness can become disturbed. It can be, um, it can have a nervous breakdown. This is a total contrast to the untouchable spirit. You, your spirit form is invulnerable. Now your personality is what gets used when you do creative acts like write a book or write music or drive your car, for example. That all comes from your material consciousness. If you get out of line and you become haughty, egotistical, that comes from your spiritual consciousness. I mean your material consciousness. Um, so your spirit form is always neutral positive, like the universal consciousness. Your material consciousness has to be trained and this is one of the things you have to learn. You have to really repeat and repeat and repeat to train that material consciousness. Because out of your thoughts come the circumstances of your life. And your good thoughts will transfer to good feelings. Your good feelings then transfer into good habits. And your good thoughts, good feelings, good habits produce good circumstances in your life. So you're the master of your own destiny. You're the creator of your own good luck. Uh, you also need to nurture, clarify your healthy thoughts. And healthy thoughts are very important to the health of your body, uh, among other things. And it's very important to be able to maintain healthy thinking. Now, one of the most healthy kinds of thinking that you can do deals with trying to understand creation. Creation is a mystery. The universal consciousness is a mystery in an immeasurable expanse. But the more you learn about it, the, the healthier you be. One of the most important things that you can study is the love of creation. And the infinite love of creation connects all life because in all life, that love lies hidden. Infinite, what does it mean to be infinite? That means that something cannot be measured. It's boundless. And by love, and I'm talking about the love of this universal consciousness, this is a love based on deep reverence, based on respect. What is creation? Creation is the this spiritual energy that pervades our universe. It's the universal, universally neutral positive spiritual energy that has no personality, that radiates an infinite love. It's everywhere. It's in this, all the spiritual realm. It's in all the physical realm. It creates all things in both the physical and the spiritual realm. And we, I read that passage, the infinite love of creation connects all life. Well, connection is a bond. So the love of creation, when you start to really feel love back towards creation, you will create a real connection between you and all living things. Um, trees have a connection with other living things. For example, all of creation is connected. For example, trees give us shade. Shade is a coolness, a shelter from the direct sunlight. Shade actually helps other plants grow and some, some certain kind of plants. Trees, for example, just to how... How are you connected to creation? Go out and look at a tree. Your tree, uh, trees, they give you, if you're open at all, will give you a psychological support. They'll give you a kind of inspiration. Trees give us wood for our homes and furnitures. They moderate the weather. How do they moderate the weather? 
Well, they cause the, the reflection doesn't come back. The, the sun comes down. The trees absorb that heat. Okay? And they, at the same time, produce shade. So they keep a moderate weather. You know, they stop all of that light from being ref reflected. Even in the wintertime, especially. If you reflect off that snow, you lose all the heat. Trees moderate the weather. Trees prevent floods and erosion. They even create a turbulence, which helps rain clouds form. Trees are a home for wildlife. So creation is connected. It connects all life. So you're connected to the trees. You may not realize it. You're connected to all life. So that's one of the understandings that slowly, over a long time, comes in as you study the creation more and more. Now, this love is hidden. The love of creation is hidden in people. It must be sought out. It must be looked for. It must be developed in you. Uh, and it takes time. It's not easily seen or found. It takes a little time. Now, <clears throat> you can study creation from a couple different perspectives. One is kind of a materialistic way, which I don't think is the best way. But occasionally I will study creation from this way. For example, one of the things, and Simyasi talks about this in Contact Report 10, and Simyasi is Billy's third contact, a woman from a planet called Ira, who is a, what they call an Ishrish, or halfway there, and half, half Queen of Wisdom. And she would land her ship there in Schmidruti in Switzerland in the beginning. is right around 1975, and Billy would drive out there with a moped, and they would sit and talk. And she would say, within the human, the human is a microcosm within the macrocosm. What does that mean? That means that within the human is a something called a spirit form, which is an image a, you could call it a fractal image. Our spirit form is a part piece of creation. So we have self-similarity. That's a pattern in nature. Um, so we have this, the, the spirit the, of the universal consciousness creates all of these infinitely complex patterns, which are always appearing in nature. They are self-similar. They are fractal. They are detailed. They're recursive. They are ubiquitous. They're everywhere in nature. Mountains are repeating patterns of triangles. Trees are repeating patterns of branches that look like nodes. Broccoli has a repeating pattern a shape in the plant. The moon has a repeating pattern of craters. Arteries, which transport your blood, have a branching structure that's much like trees. The clouds have repeating patterns, circular patterns. That These are fractals. They're repeating patterns. Waves on top of a great wave are smaller waves. And the most interesting, or one of the most interesting fractals in nature are the repeating curves from a river, if you fly over a river at 20 or 30,000 feet, or even 10,000 feet, maybe even lower, you can still see these repeating curves that look much like a snake as it moves back and forth with these repeating curves across the ground. So there's all of these repeating patterns in nature because it's all from one intelligence. One super intelligence. And we're finally to the point where we can understand a little bit about creation from the material consciousness. This is what I believe anyway. I, this is what Semyase calls material intellectual thinking, which can be bad because it's only part of the picture. It doesn't really... If you want to know the love of creation, open yourself to the love of creation. Um, put a thought up there that you want to understand 
the love of creation and you will experience it you will experience the thought let me read something to you here it says the person must only be willing to see and recognize this love and he will begin to feel it if he opens to the love of creation and he allows it to flow into himself he becomes filled with respectful gratitude and great joy each smallest plant each ever so tiny animal was created in love by creation and each creation existed according to the same law of love all of life is in the absolute perfection that which it should be through the love of creation and except for humans every life form lives exactly by creation's plan only humans have turned away from love and must now learn again what true love is and now this is what i was talking about earlier the infinite love of creation connects all life because in all life this love lies hidden every tiny plant and every tiny animal fulfills its purpose in love. So maybe we can think of the human spirit form as a fractal of the larger universal consciousness. Our human spirit is a repeating fractal. It's a fragment of the universal consciousness. We have self-similarity to the universal consciousness. Contact Report 10 says, that's why the terrestrial philosophers of old spoke about the human as a microcosm within a macrocosm, because everything that is contained within the universe is also contained within the human. So that's something that, that ought to give you confidence and optimism, that ought to make you relaxed and cheerful. The image of creation, the spirit within him, the existence that is without dimension, it bears all dimensions within itself and at the same time transcends all dimensions. Now, there's something I could spend another lifetime studying to try to come to a complete understanding. But I wanted to just reiterate or revisit the idea of what creation is. Now, our universe, according to Meyer information, it has seven belts. These are, these are seven units. We have a, a universe that's parallel to ours. It's called the Tao universe. It's 46 trillion years old. It was created at the same time that our universe was created. It's a sister universe. And our universe is divided into seven units. They're belts, and they counter-rotate with one another. They're oval in shape. Uh, we have a central core belt, an earth core belt, and the third belt is an earth space belt. These are positive, and they flow into the material belt. So positive energies flow from the earth space belt into the material belt. The material belt is where all the galaxies, the stars, the solar systems are, the comets, the gases, the dark matter. And the fifth belt sends negative energies into the material belt. So the negative and the positive form physical matter. And physical matter only can last for maybe 15 billion years, something like that. And it goes back to being fine matter again. So you won't have, that's why our, our scientists think that the solar system is only about 15 billion years old or so. That's all they know because they don't understand that there's a spirit realm. So the sixth belt after the transformation belt is the creation belt and finally displacement belt. So there are seven counter rotating belts in our creation. And it's not a Heavenly Father, it's not Mother Nature, it's a superintelligence, it's neutral positive, it's called a Wesenheiten in the German. It works according to a predetermined plan, 
it in terms of its own evolution it's does not have hardly any effect it cannot speed up or slow down its own evolution it is not disturbed in any way it keeps on right on evolving and that's what its goal is and that's why you have a spirit form and that's why you have a material life to play a role in this evolution because after your your seven stages of reincarnation you merge back with creation and you bring all your experience with you so again our entire universe is 46 trillion years old it will expand for something like 155 trillion years and it will slowly start to com to collapse upon itself again and it will eventually become small and dormant and then there'll be something like a big bang again and it will go through another expansion phase and it will go to the second stage of its evolvement so those are um the, the the this is the function of how uni the universe evolves and what your role is in it um, there are certain universal laws that are called the creational natural laws and one of those is love I talked about that briefly the love of creation it's an effective love it's very stable it's not it doesn't change True love is very stable. It's a love based on respect and veneration, where romantic love is very unstable. It's based on attraction and romance. The law of love is the highest form of love. Uh, love is the highest principle in all creation, and through it, everything exists in absolute logic. So without the love of creation, nothing would exist. And there's a logic in creation as we turned, we talked a little bit about earlier how the tree produces shade, stops erosion. All, all of nature has its own purpose. Every tiny plant and every tiny animal fulfills its purpose in love. The purpose of the human being is striving. That is the second creational law. It's the fundamental law of evolution. Without striving, there is no happiness. For the human to be happy, he has to be striving. Uh, unfortunately, religions, they, for some reason, they stifle striving. They throttle striving. To be a believer means to be without striving. To no longer have any initiative in regard to the natural achievement, advancement. And to no longer be integrated into evolution. To be without striving means to stagnate and to wither. Uh, Billy says dogmas destroy the striving of the human being. And he becomes powerless and incapable of living. You are no longer able to make your way alone and independently. And you will lose your individual individuality. So if you are involved in religion it will all of your striving will become non-viable and you will have and you will be ruled by criminal deeds eventually or uncontrollable pathological cravings vices irrationality and delusional assumptions It's very important to maintain striving. Your striving at any given time may be uh, something. You may be a scientist working or a technical person working on some technical thing. You may just be cleaning out your garage. But to be happy, you need to continue striving. Striving creates the life right up to the being. Striving means delectation, which is satisfaction in a form that's always fulfilling. If you feel afflicted, it's probably because of your inhibited striving. Uh, inhibited striving brings inhibited evolution, stagnation, hopelessness. If you feel hopeless right now, I would tell you to get to work. Clean out your garage. Clean out your closet. Do whatever kind of work that you can. Um, 
without striving, you have grief, confusion, irrationality. So keep working, whatever you do. If you have joylessness, cognitionless, unpeace, disharmony, lovelessness, resentment, then start striving, start working, read something, learn something. Self-deceit and reluctance for life means you have a lack of striving. Uh, har harmony and happiness, uh, everything positive, as well as grief and everything negative in the end, are only a revelation of how pronounced your striving is, or the striving of any life form. We have a great um, opiate crisis today. We have a lot of addiction because people do not understand these creational natural laws. They don't understand the law of striving, which is the fundamental law of all evolution and all life. The other law is the creational natural law of harmony, which means you need to keep the, the neutral positive thinking. We talked about that a little bit earlier. Um, that means there's a negative and a positive, and you keep the two balanced. But you still are confident, you're still optimistic, you're still relaxed, you're cheerful, and you're enthusiastic. Now, if you do that, you will eventually have the law of prosperity and abundance. Now, the law of prosperity and abundance says that every life form has everything in plentiful abundance in order to be able to live and evolve. Now, the one thing that challenges that and can destroy the law of prosperity and abundance is overpopulation. And that's where, why we're going to spend, hopefully, the next hour talking with a expert on overpopulation. I think I'm probably going to have to call him or remind him during the break. But uh, <coughs> So overpopulation is a gigantic problem that the planet is facing. There's another creational natural law that deals with your thoughts. It says that every thought that's enlivened by might and power must, as a cause, also bring an effect. And the effect of the thought is directly proportional to its might and power. So, if you have thoughts that are enlivened by might and power, they will have an effect on your life. It's guaranteed it's the universal creation law. Now, if those thoughts are negative and they're enlightened or enlivened by negative thoughts, negative feelings, then you will have a negative impact on your life. If they're neutral positive thoughts and they're enlivened by might and power, they will have a neutral positive effect in your life. And the thoughts, the power of the thoughts is directly proportional. The effect of the thoughts, excuse me, is directly proportional to the might and power of the thoughts. Now, one of the other creational natural laws is that we should be keeping about 500 million people um, on the planet. We're, we're about 7 billion people now, which is very, very dangerous to the biosphere. And um, uh, I've talked a little bit about overpopulation uh, before on the show, but it's something that we, we, we cannot lose track of. Let's say there's 7 billion people on our planet. Yes, you can... You can jam all those people into Texas, or even in the northern part of Texas. Just like you could jam, if you had a 2,000 square foot house, you could jam 200 people into your house, give them 10 square feet apiece, take out all the furniture. Now, it's going to be miserable. You're going to destroy your whole plumbing system, obviously, trying to service 200 people going to the restroom. You're going to destroy your everything where these people are shoulder to shoulder you have a constant trips to get food it's going to be a constant uh, sense of strife back and forth it will be miserable and that's where we're headed if people 
uh, don't wake up if we don't start to institute some controls in in our life. We need uh, what's called population uh, control. We need to balance out. Let's 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 let me give you another example. We have seven billion people alive. We're going to put them all in Texas. You've heard people say, yeah, you can bring them all into Texas, and that will all work out just fine. Well, let's say we're going to, as true Texans, give them meat to eat. So we're going to keep 7 billion cows around so everybody gets a cow during their lifetime. And let's say you give two acres per cow, which is about the normal amount. That will give you 14, 14 billion acres. And we'll finish this discussion on the other side. Talk to you in a bit. to Earth through the rainbow crystal bubbles from the furthest reaches of space and time, across the dimensions through the elements, and in harmony with the colors of the universe. Through her mastery of abstract stream of consciousness malapropisms, she weaves a web of comic, satiric, cosmic conversation. Her subjects can range from Norman, the goose next door, to astrology and Earth changes and into the deep recesses of the soul matrix. She holds a wealth of knowledge on herbs, plants, and astrology. Join Mona and her guests on Adventures of a Feral Hippie as she touches the earthly radio waves five days a week at 2 p.m. Monday to Friday on Studio B at Revolution Radio. About the origins of the human race. Join me, Gavin McCall, in a variety of. Thank <laughs> you. 
I wonder if he's not getting any messages. Oh, that's just Thamscape. He can inform the guests, and he can't even listen to Saturday mornings. Hmm. I wonder what's happening here. I wonder if I hung up. Oh. Oh, let me try again.